Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. This is episode number two in the carbon cycle and energy security revision unit over here on my channel. Today we're going to be looking at the carbon cycle so if this is what you're after excellent stick around subscribe down below. I'll try and remember to link the first episode in the playlist up here but if I forget you can go and find it in the playlist section on my channel. Yeah, it's exactly what I need to join my levels and so I'm making it for you guys because I'm sure some of you need it too. So without further ado, let's get in and look at the carbon cycle. Understanding carbon. Carbon provides major building blocks for all life on earth. It regulates our climate making it warm enough to survive and is stored within rocks, plants and oceans. Stores of carbon are also referred to as pools, stocks and reservoirs. There are terrestrial, oceanic and atmospheric stores. Flux refers to the movement or transfer of carbon between stores. Fluxes create cycles and feedbacks. Human activity is part of the carbon cycle and planetary health is placed at risk as more carbon enters the atmosphere. However, the amounts added by human activity are tiny compared with the flows that are exchanged naturally between oceans, land and atmosphere each day. The geological carbon cycle. The geological carbon cycle is a natural cycle that moves carbon between land, oceans and atmosphere. This movement involves a number of chemical reactions that create new stores which trap carbon for significant periods of time. There tends to be a natural balance between carbon production and absorption within this cycle. However, there can be occasional disruptions and short periods before the equilibrium is restored, such as when major volcanic eruptions emit large quantities of carbon into the atmosphere, or when natural climate change occurs. The carbon cycle contains two types of carbon, geological and biologically derived. Geological carbon results from the formation of sedimentary carbonated carbonate rocks, limestone and chalk, in the oceans, and biologically derived carbon is stored in shale, coal and other sedimentary rocks. Maintaining an equilibrium. The impact of emissions from volcanic eruptions is to send extra CO2 into the atmosphere, which leads to rising temperatures, increased evaporation and higher levels of atmospheric moisture. This in turn leads to increased acid rain, which weathers rocks and creates bicarbonates that will eventually be deposited as carbon on the ocean floor. This process is slow, perhaps a few hundred thousand years, but this chemical weathering process slowly rebalances the carbon cycle. The biogeochemical carbon cycle. Biological and chemical processes determine just how much of the carbon available on Earth is stored or released at any one time. That's often why it's referred to as biogeochemical carbon cycle. The role of living organisms is critical in maintaining the efficient running of this system because they control the overall balance between storage, release, transfer and absorption. The four key processes in the cycle are photosynthesis, removing CO2 from the atmosphere to promote plant growth, respiration, releasing CO2 into the atmosphere as animals consume plant growth and breathe, decomposition, breaking down organic matter and releasing CO2 into soils, and combustion of biomass and fossil fuels, releasing CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Together, these four processes continually transfer carbon from one store to another. The time period which the carbon stays in any one store is important, and since the Industrial Revolution, deeply buried stores of carbon have been exploited and burnt, releasing CO2 into the atmosphere. This picture shows the biogeochemical cycle and the enhanced flow of CO2 from the geosphere, the Earth, to the atmosphere as a result of combustion caused by human activity. How much carbon is there? The Earth's total carbon store is very large, but it's the rate of exchange or flux between the individual stores that matter most. Scientists measure the amount of carbon on Earth in gigatons or petagrams. Each gigaton or petagram of carbon equals 1 billion tonnes. It's estimated that 180 gigaton of carbon has been added to the atmosphere as a result of burning fossil fuels. Whilst this is tiny in comparison to the amount that is transferred naturally, 
It is enough to alter the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and to trigger climate change. Types of carbon. Carbon comes in several forms and we need to know where these occur within the carbon cycle. As they flow between stores, the balances can be altered and the knock-on effect can impact the cycle. Carbon cycling is simply the movement from one form to another. The three forms of carbon are inorganic, found in rocks as bicarbonate and carbonate, the Earth's largest carbon store, organic, found in plant material, and gaseous, found as CO2, HC4 and CO. Fluxes and balances. Every year, vast quantities of carbon are exchanged between stores. These exchanges are called fluxes. Inorganic carbon is released by chemical weathering very slowly, over decades or hundreds of years, but fluxes between the Earth's surface, plants and atmosphere are much faster, a matter of months or seasons. Fluxes within the carbon cycle can be shown using proportional arrows. The width of each arrow is drawn in proportion to the amount of carbon transferred. Variations in carbon fluxes. As well as adding carbon to the atmosphere, the Earth's carbon reservoirs also remove it, remove it into carbon sinks in a series of fluxes. The speed of fluxes between these sinks varies both globally and over time. Fast and slow. The quickest cycle is completed in seconds, as plants take carbon in from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. They then release it by respiration. Sunlight, temperature and moisture all control the speed of these processes. If it's too dark, hot or cold, they decrease. Low levels of CO2 in the atmosphere are also reduced at the speed of the cycle. Dead organic matter in soils may retain carbon for years or even centuries, waiting to be broken down. Think of an alive tree on your garden. It takes in CO2 from the atmosphere, whereas a dead tree holds the CO2 and eventually makes its way to the sea via the soil and decomposition. Some organic materials may become buried so deeply that they don't decay at all, instead forming into sedimentary rocks, such as limestone or coal, or alternatively into hydrocarbons, commonly referred to as oil and natural gas. CO2 is only then released when they are burnt, or when limestone is used industrially, through making cement for example. Geographical patterns. Since regional climates influence rates of photosynthesis and respiration, it's not surprising to see CO2 fluxes with latitude. Levels are always higher in the northern hemisphere because it contains greater land masses and greater temperature variations than the southern hemisphere. And that is the end of episode two. I hope you enjoyed. I'll try and remember to link the rest of the playlist up here, but if I forget, you can go and find that on my channel. Please do subscribe down below as next week, we're gonna be trying to cover the topic of carbon sequestration. So it's a big topic and yeah, I hope you enjoy. See you same time, same place next week, Monday, 4.30 p.m. Bye guys.